All right, good morning, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Jen. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, in case you're wondering. Uh, and this is me on Twitter. Uh, it has a cheeky double underscore in the middle, which makes me really hard to find if you're trying to find me on the internet. Uh, so I am the head of technical writing at the Government Digital Service in the UK. Uh, so we're part of the UK government. We're actually part of the Cabinet Office. Uh, and that part of government exists to support the rest of government do their job. And as you can imagine, right now, we're rather busy. But uh, <laughs> thankfully for you and for me, uh, we're not going to talk about any of that today, which is great. Uh, we're going to talk about this stuff instead. So the government digital service builds lots of products and services for the rest of government to use. Um, so that could be things like a payments platform or a hosting platform. And all of those products need documentation. And that's where my technical writing team comes in. So we write the docs. They look like this, and that's all great. Um, and we manage all of our documentation, our external facing documentation, and our internal facing documentation using documentation as code, all of it. So this is a story about how the UK government got to that point, because it hasn't always been this way by any means. Um, even though it's me stood on this stage today, I just want to make clear that this work is not only mine. There is a big team behind all of this work, uh, some of whom are here today in the audience somewhere. Hey, Andrew. Uh, and there are also some people that aren't with us today. Oh, not because they passed away. They're just in London. <laughs> oh, God. That's awful. Yeah, they're just in London. Uh, so the, this kind of work was completed by tech writers, designers, developers, and there, there's lots of them. So we've heard a bit about Docs as Code already at this conference. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's the practice of applying software development tools and processes to technical documentation. It sounds easy. It's great. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that easy although it looks like it when you start out. So if you look at a tech writer process like this, you know, you write, you edit, there's some kind of review and then you publish. Things are great. Uh, and if you look at a kind of a developer workflow, things are quite similar. You're writing, you're just writing code, you're doing some relevant review, you're gonna do some testing, and then you're gonna deploy it, you're gonna publish it, stick it out. So on the surface, our processes really don't look that different. So again, there's the assumption that this is gonna be easy. So heading into this project, we were really hopeful it was gonna look a little bit like this. You start at point A, you get to point B, it's very neat, it's lovely. There's no difficulty here. Uh, perhaps there might be a little bit of a wobble in the middle, but it's fine because you're gonna overcome it and it's gonna be great. Unfortunately for us, our docs as code process and getting to that point looks a little bit like this. So the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed uh, that this arrow at the end doesn't quite point to the B yet. <laughs> Uh, and in about 28 minutes, I would have told you why. So, does anybody recognize these? I don't know how big that is up here, so I'm going to zoom in a bit. A few familiar faces up here. All right, so these are choose your own adventure books. Uh, and if, like me, you kind of grew up in the 80s and 90s, these might have been a staple of your childhood. So you're kind of presented with a situation, some kind of scenario that you've got yourself in, and then you have to answer some kind of questions to choose your own fate. Um, you might, if you haven't read these books, you might have played games like Bioshock or Tyranny, or you might have watched like Netflix's Bandersnatch, or you might have played things like uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's all quite fun. So for me, Doctor's Code is extremely similar to a choose your own adventure game in the best possible way. Um, because you're placed in all sorts of scenarios that you're not expecting, and you have to make a shed load of decisions and choices about what you're gonna do. So the fate of your documentation is completely in your hands. So uh, today I'm gonna tell the story of how the UK government got to Doctor's Code in our own choose your own adventure format. Um, I'm gonna present to you the decisions and the scenarios that we were placed in, and then we're gonna see if you make the same decisions that we did when we were in this place, and we're gonna see where we end up. Uh, so I warn you this is no fairy tale. As ever in all good stories, there are monsters and baddies, um, but we have some heroes of our story. This is our developers, our technical writers, and our designers that are helping us get going. Uh, and fair warning, uh, you've seen some amazing illustrations from other kind of conference speakers. I cannot draw to save my life, so you're going to have to put up with my terrible illustrations. Okay, you ready? Let's do this. So, oh. Sorry, bear with. Eric, I think we're missing some pictures, but it's fine because my illustrations are terrible. So, because uh, I'm a writer, not an artist, so it's all right. Okay, so uh, if you've played these sort of games before, you'll know they start with a scenario. This is your first scenario. You wake up in a government building. Uh, you know that you have been hired by GDS. You're wearing a government pass and you feel quite excited to be there, and it's great. Um, if you could see the illustrations, you would know that you're wearing a cloak. Uh, not that civil work servants wear cloaks, but I think cloaks are cool and more people should wear them. <laughs> Uh, at that point, there's a knock at the door and a user researcher enters and they tell you that they've got some user research on technical documentation at GDS. Here's your first scenario. 
Do you want to see what the research shows? Do you A, say yes, that you want to see all previous user research on technical documentation, or do you B, say no, why would you bother finding out what your users need? Uh, show of hands for A, do you want to see the research? Cool. B, no, you have no interest in users. Ah, <laughs> ah. So we went with A. Yes, of course we want to see the user research. That's what we love. Uh, so when I joined GDS, uh, we were quite lucky. We had researchers that had done lots of research on our docs and our products, uh, and it was really, really clear our docs were performing extremely poorly. Uh, so our users, it was, it was bad. They were having a really bad time. Our docs were really inconsistent. They were published in different places. Sometimes they weren't published at all online. They might be in a PDF attached to an email. It was bad. They couldn't find what they needed. Uh, for technical writers, and we were building a technical writing team at the time, uh, and government, well, GDS, didn't have any tech writers at that time at all. So they were new to Gov, new to GDS, and they were moving between teams, and everything was really inconsistent. And we were wasting lots of time training each other on different sets of tools and all sorts of stuff. And it was just really, really frustrating. Uh, and our developers really wanted to help us out, and they really wanted to contribute to our docs, but they couldn't because they were locked away in proprietary tools or enclosed repository somewhere or in a PDF that no one had the original version of which wasn't great. And so all of that meant that our docs weren't keeping up with our agile product development. Uh, we weren't kind of uh, paying, well, we were paying too much on support, basically, to answer very basic queries. And I think it's fair to say that sadness reigned across the land. It was not good. Hey, the illustrations are back. I told you they were bad. OK, so second scenario. You decide something needs to be done about this whole situation. Enter this wonderful magician called Ritius Docius. It's nice. <laughs> So you go to write the docs, and they tell you there's this newish movement in technical documentation, and it's really cool, and all the cool kids are doing it, and it might solve some of your problems, and it's called docs as code. However, you are pretty skeptical. So do you A, run a little experiment to see how it actually works, or B, ignore the mage and find some cash for a proprietary publishing tool? Hands up for A. <laughs> nice. Hands up for B. Hey, reality, yes, exactly. There is no cash, especially in government. So. We went with A. So we started playing around with this new setup. We figured out very quickly on a small scale that this could actually work, and this was great. But we had no idea if it was going to work on a large scale. Government is big. We need to do this on a big, big scale. Uh, and we also didn't know what the future of GDS was going to hold. So like I say, we were a new technical writing team. We were trying to uh, establish ourselves quite early on. So we needed to make some really strong tooling decisions so our tech community could trust us with our docs, but with our tooling as well. So we didn't want to make any mistakes. So to do that, we knew that we needed some support for some more people. But again, money was tight. So we want some help. We want a huge army of people that's going to help us with this. However, our choices were we could either A, hire a technical writer with some kind of software developer skills to help us get up and running, or we could plead and bargain with your neighborhood developers to come and help us out. So A, are you going to hire a tech writer that has the skills you need? How's that for A? All right. Or are you going to B, you're going to plead and bargain? Plead and bargain. Oh, I feel so validated. This is nice. <laughs> OK. So this is exactly what we did. Um, we, at that point, the hiring freeze had come down. We couldn't hire anybody else. Uh, we had a small, small motley, motley band of technical writers. Uh, and we basically had to go out to our tech community. And I mean, there were donuts. There was chocolate. There was beer. It was absolute all-out bribery, basically, to get this work done. Um, and the good news is there was big appetite for this, which was lovely. And they really wanted to find ways to improve our docs and make it easier to contribute. They'd been in user research sessions, and they had seen our users struggle with this firsthand so they could empathize with it. Um, so we had their support, but we still needed the cash. So you meet a friendly civil servant with a comically large tie. He tells you, <laughs> he tells you that nothing gets done in government without an awful lot of paperwork. And he's right. He tells you that you need to write a business case. And as part of the business case, you need to explain which team you're going to give this development work to. So do you, A, give it to a product team who already have end user existing docs, or do you give it to a product team who have no docs at all? Hands up for A. Cool. Hands up for B. Interesting. That's an even split, pretty much. Uh, we ended up giving it to a team that had no external facing docs which on the surface might seem a little bit weird. Why would you not give it to a product team who have docs and can test it out in the wild? Um, well, it turns out we had a team that were looking at cross-government and cross-product needs. So this team would later go on to create a cross-government design system. They were creating product pages for all of our products. Um, and the documentation worked, fitted really, really neatly in there. It also meant that we weren't waylaid by product-specific documentation needs, and we could create something that was really agnostic for everybody, which was lovely. 
But uh, then we uh, had to decide how we were going to do this, how you're going to store and manage all this stuff. Uh, we decided quite early on that we were going to use Git, but we needed a place to then stick everything. Um, and we needed somewhere to put our repositories. So first big question, where do you put your docs? Do you A, stick them in GitHub, or B, stick them in GitLab? Caveat, there are other options, but this is quite binary, so I'm just going to have to stick with two. Uh, a, GitHub, and B, GitLab. Cool. Uh, this one really doesn't matter. It feels like a big fork in the road. Uh, for us, this was a quite a straightforward choice. We chose GitHub only because that's what our developers were using. It probably wouldn't have made a massive bit of difference, but for us, we decided to match our developer workflow. And obviously, there's no wrong or right choice there. Uh, this is the uh, open kind of um, uh, GitHub organization that all of GDS's code and content sits in. It's called AlphaGov. Uh, you can find it on the wonders of the World Wide Web. Um, and you can go and poke through it if you want. Uh, we still use that today, and that's where all of our docs now sit. Heading back into our story. A wild stakeholder appears. <laughs> and uh, he looks pretty grumpy with you. Um, so he questions the value of this whole project. And basically, he wants to know, why are you spending so much time fixing your tooling when you're not fixing the content itself? So we had done a really, really good job of explaining why it was so important to fix the content. And we'd hired all these people, and then we directed them to work on a project just about tooling rather than fixing the content itself. So your choices are, do you A, admit that yes, he's right, you should fix that first, and then come back to the tooling and ramp up your efforts to improve that core content? Or do you B, find out what matters to that stakeholder and then repitch the project from the start? How's up for A? Fixing the content, nice. Uh, or B, do you find out what, what matters to that stakeholder? Cool. Some undecided people, but it's fine because I'm going to tell you the answer. Uh, so we went with B. We wanted to do A um, because we'd got ourselves in that situation. Of course, we wanted to improve the content, and we were still doing that on the sidelines. Um, but actually, we took time to understand why that stakeholder was so concerned. And really, we just bit ourselves in the foot. That's the wrong metaphor, but I'll come back to that. Uh, so we had done such a good job explaining why content needed to be improved that we hadn't spent time showing him the pain that tech writers and developers had you know, were experiencing trying to update our docs. So we showed him an example in an open repository. We said, here's some open content. It's just like open code. GDS loves that. Why would you not want to do this? We showed how we could reduce support ticket costs by responding more quickly, uh, how we could invite contributions from across government, and if we did this really, really well, how we could package all that up and open it up for anyone in government to then use. Your stakeholder is happy. <laughs> is great. Uh, he disappears off into his corner office and whatever those people do, uh, and it's great. So you now, with your team, because you now finally have a team and you finally have some cash, uh, now need to choose a static site generator. So this is the thing that's going to compile all of your, all your files, apply the nice layout, and then kind of like build your fancy website at the end. Um, and your development team now have a shortlist for you. So do you A, choose Jekyll? Because that old mange that we talked about earlier uh, said that Jekyll was super cool and everyone is using it. Or do you B, choose Hugo, because it's got so many templates to choose from? Uh, hands up for A, Jekyll. Nice. Hands up for B, Hugo. Oh, nice. Uh, we decided to go with Hugo. Um, we thought we would need more templates, and we wanted to experiment with templates. Hugo, on a very quick analysis, had lots of templates to play with, so we decided to start there. Ooh. Uh, very early on, we figured out that that was actually the wrong choice for us. Um, it's super, super popular in the static site generator and docs as code kind of world. Um, and that was fine. And we had no issues with it. Um, but it's written in Go. And GDS doesn't have a lot of Go experience, and it definitely didn't at the time. So we said from a maintenance perspective, and we were pretty sure we were going to have to build some extensions or play around with this and customize it, um, that actually we wanted to pick something that we had more experience in. Um, and we w went back to kind of the drawing board on our things that we were looking at to assess our static site generators. And we looked at things like maturity of the community, so how often and how frequently are the releases, um, how big is the community, what are the contributors like, are they responsive to any issues, that kind of thing. Um, and we also wanted to look at plugins and extensions. Um, so we decided to go back to the drawing board. We went back to this question, and we said, OK, fine. Now do we look at Jekyll, or do we pick a static site generator that no one has ever heard of? Has up for A. Yeah, that would be sensible. As up for B, A, and that's where we ended up. Uh, so we ended up with uh, a static site generator called Middleman. 
Um, it's built in Ruby. GDS has a lot of Ruby experience. Uh, and at the time, we picked it because it had this really nice templating feature where you could kind of add custom templates, uh, and it was great. Um, and so we started work building our own front-end template that we were going to use. Uh, we later discarded that in favor of kind of bundling it as a gem. Um, but to start with, it was actually kind of what we needed. Uh, and it was quite handy at the start. So. Uh, the project kind of continues. Everything is all great. Uh, you then do some more user research on your existing documentation. Um, and it turns out that your primary users are people using your API docs. Uh, and a primary need there is to display reference information. Um, our user research indicates that putting all that API reference information on one single page is the best way to serve your users' needs. And they're happy to do Control F and find the information they need. You're surprised by this, um, but you decide to go ahead with it anyway. So knowing that, do you design your template to use a single page design or a multi-page design? How's that for A? Yeah, user research says it. Uh, or B, multi-page design. Cool, I wish I'd listened to you. Where were you three years ago? Uh, we went with a single page design. Our single page design looks a little bit like this. Pretty standard, has your left hand nav, and it was a big old page of stuff that you had to scroll down. Um, and our user research to start with indicated this wasn't a problem. Uh, our users were just control everything all over the place, and they were very, very happy. Uh, but then we needed to take a look at TechWriter workflows. So this was our first big kind of content decision when it came to Docs as code. So I'm going to put you in this seat right now. Do you put your documentation files with the code or in a separate repository? With the code, where it should be. How's that for A? <laughs> yeah. Uh, or B, stick them in a separate repository. Uh, you might have read our blog posts. We went with a separate repository. So we ummed and ahmed over this a lot. Uh, obviously, the whole, well, one of the main kind of uh, benefits of doing Docs as code is you could put your content really close to your code and then keep in line with all the releases and stuff that you're doing. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, for us, we decided to follow that approach for our internal facing docs. So for those people that were maintaining the products, we'd put that documentation with the code. Um, but for end user facing docs, we decided to set up a separate repository uh, and put that all elsewhere. Uh, we did that for several reasons. One is findability. You might have noticed on that AlphaGov organization, there's a ridiculous number of repositories. Um, and a lot of our products are built using microservices. And the way that the devs have split up those repositories is that they're in multiple places. So we could have had content in multiple places and code in multiple places, and then had to compile them all from separate sources. We could have done that. We decided to make our lives easier and went with a separate repository. Our separate repository docs look a little bit like this. Um, we still stick with this even now. So here's an example of a payments platform uh, documentation here. So it's just a whole separate repository on its own. Um, also, we had this because it means that we can change the access permissions on a whole repository. So for this, is completely open. Uh, and then we could introduce uh, limited approvals, which I will come to in a bit. So you're in the swing of things with your content. It's great. Uh, but now you need to look at your information architecture. So some of your docs are already quite neatly modularized. That's nice. Um, you've already made the decision that you're going to use Markdown. You use Markdown because your gov.uk team down the hallway have their own flavor of Markdown called GovSpeak, because we're special, uh, which is really, really nice. So you're moving everything to Markdown, and everything's all great. But you have one set of docs remaining that are written in restructured text, and you go to find out why. They're written in restructured text because they're really, really complicated. There's all sorts of reuse all over the place. And there's lots of single sourcing going on, lots of cross-referencing. They're also wildly out of date. They're a complete nightmare, and they're far too long. It's basically the yellow pages of technical documentation. So what do you do with those docs? Do you A, convert them from restructured text to Markdown to feed into your new process? Or do you B, keep them restructured text and just make them play nicely with the new tooling? Hands up for A. Hands up for B. Haha. <laughs> We decided to try and convert them from restructured text to Markdown and feed them into our process. We did that with the help of our Paladin Pandoc, uh, which is great. Um, but unfortunately, our docs are still a complete mess at this stage. Even with Pandoc's help, the output is bad, the reuse is all over the place, and they're getting really messy. And we're spending a lot of time trying to fix those docs and feed them into this process. So we have another chat. Do we write a script to basically help out that Pandoc output and do some more kind of uh, iterations on that and see if we can kind of automate some of this process? Or do you B, rewrite the docs by hand into Markdown? How's that for A? Yeah. How's that for B? Cool. You poor souls. That's exactly what we did. <laughs> I know this sounds completely bonkers, but hear us out. So we did a huge evaluation of those set of docs, and we looked at all of the issues across everything. And we came to the conclusion that actually this isn't a tooling issue. 
This is a content issue. Those docs were far too complicated. They weren't serving user need. Our support tickets were just going through the roof. It was a nightmare. So we decided actually to take a complete step back and say, we're not going to use technology to fix this problem. We're just going to use content fixes to solve this problem. So yeah, they were really, really bloated, not written in plain English. Uh, and so we started a, a project in parallel to the Docs as Code project just to tidy up these docs. Um, about a year or so later, it took a while, uh, we then converted them to Markdown and then fed them into the process. And it actually worked quite well. So you've got Git version control, you've got GitHub, it's all great. Uh, and you have got a template ready to go and an ops engineer appears with a bag of magic tricks. No one really knows how these things work. Uh, so they want to know, how do you want to deploy your docs? What do you say? Continuously, please. Or I'll trigger the builds manually, thanks. <laughs> Hands up for A, who would like to see some continuous deployment around here? Of course you would. And who wants to go and trigger the builds manually? Whoa, couple of, couple of votes for that. Nice. Uh, we started out by doing this manually. Um, not our best decision. Uh, so the whole benefit of Docs as Code is that you can automate everything and have nice continuous integration and deployment. It's all wonderful. Um, but for us, we decided that just to start with, we were going to do things manually. Um, this would come back to kind of bite us later. So we did eventually kind of like automate more of this process. But to start with, we had a very basic deployment setup. We would then go into Jenkins and then manually deploy a build. Uh, not for long, but it did exist. OK, so it's all great. Uh, our technical writers are kind of getting their head around this new process, and it's all fine. Uh, and they're trying to get their head around Git. And then their first merge conflict appears. <laughs> so you want to make a change, boom, your big, scary merge conflict appears. So what are you, a new tech writer, trying to get their head around Git? What do you do? Do you? Because you stare at it intently, hoping it's going to resolve <laughs> itself, and they just don't. Uh, do you, A, cry? <laughs> or B, do you scream? OK, hands up for A, who cries and who screams. Yay, I did both. <laughs> oh, it's so painful. Uh, so the first couple of times this happened, I just thought, oh my goodness, what on earth have I done here? I uh, went to go and find a friendly developer. It got a lot easier after that. But that's about the time that we said, we need some more training here. So we did a whole series of knowledge swap sessions with our developers where we said, you know what, if you can just teach us uh, some of the kind of slightly more advanced Git to avoid ourselves getting in this situation, we will teach you some more about documentation and blogging and whatever it will take. And we did all these knowledge swaps to basically upskill our team. Um, I still have a fear of merge conflicts, and they keep me awake at night, but it's, uh, I'm working on it. It's fine. So. You now uh, have an idea. Uh, you want to kind of avoid this kind of situation in the future, and you want to sort of preview the docs before they go live. Uh, so at this stage, uh, you've read a really great book called Docs Like Code uh, by a lady called Anne Gentle. If you're watching Anne on the recording uh, or the streaming, I'm really sorry. My artistic abilities do not do you justice. Uh, but it's a really, really great book. Uh, and she posits a really interesting question about previews. So she says you can either do them locally or on a server, depending on your workflow, whether you're going to use like a centralized or a forking approach. Um, so you are set that question. So do you want to run your previews locally, or do you want to run them on the server? Locally and server. Cool. We went local. Uh, so it took way more time to set it up, um, but actually it was great for us. Our kind of like forking workflow meant that that kind of worked for us. Uh, we could kind of set docs quite privately, which helped us with testing and prototyping. Um, I did a talk in Portland last year about user research, and really this is the thing that made that, made that possible. It meant we could test our docs in isolation from everything else, which was nice. So you've got previews, you're making changes, everything is great. Uh, you've redirected your old docs to your new docs, and things seem to be going well. Your developers, who look like elves for some reason, um, are perking up, because suddenly it's super easy to contribute, and suddenly your pull requests start flooding in, because everybody wants to help you with your docs. Uh, legit happened, I was very excited. Um, but they're full of style issues, because we haven't got around to training everyone on the extensive kind of UK style guide yet. So do you, A, build a linter to automate that style check for you, or do you be increase your training and approval checks on your existing repositories? Hands up for A. <laughs> Got to find Chris has two. Yes, lint, lint. Uh, and B, increase training and approval checks. Also, Chris, I love this. This is great. Um, it makes sense to automate it, right? We did not. <laughs> Big mistake. Should have automated this way, way earlier than we actually did. Um, however, uh, we at the time we had some existing tech writer training which we could ramp up very quickly, and we realised that we could improve some uh, approval checks on our GitHub repositories to make sure that the right people were reviewing docs before they went out. We decided to do that first, and then come back to the automation and the linters later. Um, so uh, nowadays, if you raise a pull request. Um, 
you get a couple of things. You get um, a set number of reviewers. Um, you need to have a technical writer or a lead developer on your project that will approve your pull request before it goes through and it can get merged. Um, and also we introduced, I say we, uh, there's a chap called Ben here who did a great talk yesterday. I don't know if he's here. Yes, he is. Uh, so Ben introduced some labels on all GitHub pull requests so you could indicate the sort of review that you would need. Um, and you can see them on the bottom there. Uh, so this was great. Um, suddenly everything was getting a lot easier. We then wanted to nag people uh, politely uh, about reviewing pull requests, and so we wanted to do that in Slack. So Slack is uh, a big means of communication at GDS. Um, there is an equivalent for code reviews, um, and we use that calling the seal of approval, which progressively yells at you and becomes angry if you don't look at the pull request. Um, and a developer on Gov.uk decided we need a similar thing for documentation, so we introduced, drum roll please, Daniel the Manual Spaniel, uh, who will... <laughs> Pop into your Slack channel and we'll nag you about open pull requests, which is great. Um, around this time, we then started looking at other bits of automation that we could do. We wanted it to play nicely with open API. Um, and we could make it work, but it was very, very janky. We were using things like workarounds like Widdishins, and it wasn't, it wasn't very neat at all. Um, and we had some other work that we needed, so we decided to bring in the big guns. Uh, and we brought in a, a, a giant third party, <sighs> so good, uh, to come in and help us out. But that single page design that decision that we made earlier was holding us back. Uh, so API reference on one page, fine. Having information about authentication or support on other things, developers expected to find them in different places. And so we had to make another decision about that single page design. So do you A, introduce that multi-page design that so many of you wanted so many years ago, uh, or do you stick with the single page? Has that for A? Yeah, and has that for B? Ooh, still some kind of single pages in there. Uh, so we decided to stick with the, uh, sorry, introduce the multi-page design. It now looks a little bit like this. Uh, it meant that tech writers had a lot more control over the content. Uh, we had to introduce things like a search functionality because obviously control F is no longer sufficient. Um, and it's not great, but it almost does the trick. Um, and we're still working on that now, especially that search functionality, which is not amazing. So jump forward a little bit. September 2019, there's some new accessibility regulations coming in, uh, and they're for all public sector websites in the UK. It changes things like focus dates uh, and contrast requirements and things like that. Um, the team who originally built your design template for your documentation uh, have since built a whole new design system, um, and they've actually updated the design system to use all these regulations that you need. But it requires a big update and then some tweaks to the template, uh, which is great. Unfortunately, you have literally weeks to implement it, and half your technical writers are in Prague at Write the Docs. So, how do you get developer support for this work while well, we have a great time in Prague? Uh, do you A, again, do you plead, beg, and bribe with your developers to help you out? Or do you B, write another business case for some more funding to do it properly? A, and B, A. We would have done B, but we just had no time. And also, there's no cash in the UK Gov right now. So, uh, we had to go back and plead and beg and bribe developers, which we did. Um, we have 20% time at GDS, which is a thing I think GDS have now from Google, where developers can spend 20% of their time working on a project of their choosing. Um, so we put together a little motley band of developers and technical writers to then work on this project, um, and that work is ongoing now. So jump forward a little bit more. You recognize this person? Yay. Uh, Writer Stockist is back, uh, and they tell you they're looking for suggestions for talks at Write the Docs in Prague. Do you, A? let your speaking nerves get the better of you, or do you B, pitch a talk and choose a choose your own adventure, liven up a hungover crowd? A and B, A. Cool. Right, ta-da. Here I am. Uh, I hope you had a very good night last night, by the way, which is good. Uh, so yeah, this is where we are. GDS uses docs as code for all of our documentation. It's by no means being an easy ride at all, um, but we use Git, GitHub, Middleman. Uh, if you're worried about our hosting, we host it on a uh, platform as a service thing that we built ourselves, which we use for the rest of government, which is easy. Um, and it's not just us. Uh, Ministry of Justice, Home Office, other government departments in the UK now use what we've built in order to make their documentation more consistent, which is really, really nice. So we still have a lot of work to do. I told you we're not quite at that B point yet. Um, so we're looking at things like the new accessibility regulations, improving our search functionality, uh, things like this. Uh, we're looking to automate more. Going back to that, those linters and those style checks, probably using Veil. Chris will be very happy to hear that. Uh, so there's still work to be done. But on the whole, we've seen really, really big benefits. Uh, our users are really happier. Our template is more consistent. They know where to look for stuff. 
they can find it much, much more easily. Uh, our support costs and our support tickets have gone way, way down. Um, our developers are happier. Uh, they can contribute a lot faster and a lot easier. Uh, it means they can just focus on writing the docs rather than doing any training or any kind of uh, additional stuff that they need. Um, so we do sometimes wonder about that path not taken. There's all sorts of decisions that you can make here. Uh, and we could have ended up in any number of scenarios, right? And like all those choose your own adventure books, there's normally 40 or so outcomes that you could have. Uh, and that's still the case here. Um, but you know, we're not in a bad place and it's okay. So if you're thinking about going on your own venture uh, for Docs as Code, uh, I would say go for it. But be aware, you know, you will have a lot of decisions to make. You will have your baddies to fight. You'll need to find your people that are going to be able to save you. Um, but if you're up for an adventure, I promise it will be a lot of fun. And finally, if you want to lead my troop of merry technical writers in government, I'm actually leaving GDS at the end of this year. Uh, so if you fancy being the dungeon master of technical writing in government, uh, you absolutely can be. So please come and have a chat with me at the end or come and find me on Twitter. Just remember that weird double underscore. Thank you very much for coming on this journey with me today. Thank you very much.